Hi boys and girls, Mrs. Blackburn here. I'm ready for our next read aloud. I hope you are too. This is another Fountas and Pinnell book published by Heinemann. It's called 30 Minutes Over Oregon and it is a Japanese pilot's World War II story. So if you're a World War II or a war um, story fan, I think you're really going to enjoy this one. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, an American naval base in Hawaii. The surprise attack killed thousands of soldiers and brought America into World War II. To retaliate, the U.S. bombed Tokyo from the sky. This became known as the Doolittle Raid, which would later be memorialized in both a book and film called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. In response, Japan set out to prove that continental America, through though far from all World War II combat, could also be bombed. This is the story of what happened next. Fifteen miles off the Oregon coast on September 9th, 1942, Nabuo Fujita strode across the slippery deck of a submarine. He gripped the 400-year-old samurai sword that had been in his family for generations. Come on, he told his navigator. It will soon be sun up. They climbed into a small plane that was about to be launched by catapult toward the United States. Are you thinking or wondering or visualizing what a catapult is? Okay, good. Um, a catapult, if you're not sure, um, can launch an aircraft or um, a projectile at really high speeds without any type of engine. And here's a picture of the submarine. As he did before every flight, Nabuo strapped the sword to his seat for luck. Crew members loaded 168-pound bombs under each wing of the plane. Wow, I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of weight. The Japanese hoped that the bombs would start a fire that would consume the Oregon woods, then rage into nearby towns and cities. Do not tell anyone, Nabuo's commander had told him not even your wife. So instead of sharing with Ayako what Japan, Japan had entrusted him to do, Nabuo left strands of hair and fingernail clippings for her to bury if he didn't make it back. Wow, I'm thinking that's really sad. So I guess so he, she would have a part of him left to, to bury. If the American military shot at him, his plane would not be fast enough to evade being hit. The catapult flung the plane off the sub with a hard whoosh. So you can see the submarine here. And if I move the page over, you can see the, the plane. Steering into the rising sun, Nabuo scanned the sky for American fighters, but saw none. When he flew over the tiny town of Brookings, Oregon, some of the residents heard the motor. A few saw the plane puttering through the fog, but almost none suspected it was an enemy aircraft. Shortly after 6 a.m., high above the thickly wooded mountains, nine miles east of Brookings, Nabuo gave his navigator the order. The bombs are to be dropped here. Nabuo wheeled the plane. Over his shoulder, he caught sight of a white flash below. He beelined back to the ocean, flying low enough to clip the treetops. I 
I wonder how Nabua was feeling at that time. He landed on the water and the sub crew hoisted the plane aboard with a crane. They quickly removed the wings and floats and stowed everything in a watertight hangar. The sub then dove 250 feet. Meanwhile, the forest was burning a bit. Only one of the two bombs had exploded, sparking patches of fire that didn't spread. The ground was too damp from recent rain. The other bomb had buried itself on impact without a trace. Four men from forest lookout stations spotted smoke and trudged several hours to the remote site and extinguished the flames. Let me move so you can see that a little bit better. But they noticed a splintered tree and beneath it a small pit in a circle of scorched earth. Widening the pit into a crater, they uncovered metal fragments. Some had markings in Japanese. The news that a foreign foe had flown in and out of American airspace undetected zipped through Brookings. Townsfolk were shaken, but many were more concerned for their relatives fighting overseas. Several newspapers put forth the notion that the plane may have taken off from a sub, but this was dismissed as improbable. The military assumed that the incident was isolated and did little to increase their efforts to defend the coast. Twenty days after the bombing, Nabuo did it again. Same plan, same plane. So here, I kind of want you to think a little bit about what the author um, felt about the bombings. The author who wrote the book. So what did he think about the bombings? And how do you know how the author felt based on the text? So take a moment and think about that. How do you know how the author, the writer, was feeling based on the text? And that helps us think about author's craft a little bit. Only that time for greater stealth, he went by night to protect coastal communities from becoming easy targets. The U.S. military routinely ordered blackouts during the war, but the lighthouse at Cape Blanco remained lit and guided to shore by its beam, Nabuo headed to a wooded area north of Brookings and dropped two more bombs on Oregon. On his return, Nabuo could not locate the sub. Nearly out of fuel, he resigned himself to dying with honor by winging back and crashing into the lighthouse. The mission comes first, the sub next, he said to his navigator. We come last. But a moment later, he glimpsed a dark, snaky shimmer on the ocean swells, an oil leak from his sub. So how at this point would you describe Nabuo Fujita? The author's actually giving a lot of description about his character at this time. We know that he left his um, clippings of his hair and his fingernails for his wife. We know that he was ordered not to talk about his mission to anyone. And did he? You're right, he didn't. We know that he puts himself and his life last and his orders and his country first. So what does that tell you about his character? Is he an honorable person? Is he loyal to his country? I think we could say yes. The Japanese believed the second two bombs had detonated. Americans scoured the woods but found no fragments and no damage. Or if they did, they kept quiet about it. Either way, Japan claimed both invasions as victories. They had caught America off guard. After years of war, Nabuo returned to Japan, anxious to rejoin Ayako and their son, their young son and daughter, Yoshi and Yoriko, and his ship pulled into port, into home, 
Mubuo gazed through binoculars to mask his tears. In 1945, Japan surran surrendered to the United States and its allies, ending World War II. Nobuo opened a hardware store and lived quietly in Tokyo suburb. He never discussed his Oregon raids, though they were rarely out of his mind, and the residents of Brookings largely forgot about their close call until 1962. So here he is returning to home. And here he is living in the suburbs of Tokyo, Japan. That year, the Brookings JCs, a leadership organization, was looking for a way to boost tourism to their sleepy burg. One member had a bold idea. He suggested that they track down the Japanese bomber pilot and invite him to attend their annual Memorial Day festival as a guest of honor. So they did. To their surprise, Nubuo accepted their invitation. And they weren't the only ones who were shocked. This was the first Nubuo's family had heard of what he had done in America. So Nubuo never even spoke about it to anyone. I'll show you the picture there. One U.S. publish. One U.S. newspaper published a petition condemning the idea. Those who signed felt that any soldier saluted in Brookings should be American. Furthermore, it would be expensive to fly over Nabuo, Ayako, and Yoshi, now 26, who would act as translator. Despite the pressure to cancel the visit, the JCs didn't give in. Welcoming Nabuo, they announced, would be a symbol of reconciliation not just between individuals, but between nations. That's a really important word. I want you to think about reconciliation because you'll have an activity that you'll have to do with that later on. Another newspaper printed a letter from a veteran who wrote, he was doing a job and we were doing a job. Other veterans, including the governor of Oregon and President John F. Kennedy also praised the invitation. Protesters began to open their minds. So again, let's think about this. It can be hard for enemies to reconcile, especially after a war. Why do you think it was easier for some of the Americans, um, especially American veterans, to reconcile and then some of them not? And that word reconcile means to uh, forgive and to move on. So Take a moment and think, why do you think that some of them were like, sure, yeah, let's do it. Let's invite this um, soldier that bombed our country and let's invite him and uh, make peace. And then some of them are like, no way, no way. We should be honoring American soldiers, not a, a soldier that was an enemy. Why do you think that some of them were so um, eager to reconcile and move on and some weren't? Yeah, Nabuo was nervous. Initially, he had feared that Americans were tricking him into coming so they could put him on trial as a war criminal. He worried that they would insult him, egg him, beat him, but he knew he had to go no matter what. It would be impolite to refuse. He said, again, he brought his family sword. This time, however, it was not for luck. Over the years, Nabuo's war pride had shriveled into guilt. His brother had been lost in battle. His country had suffered catastrophically when the United States dropped atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And through his bombings, and though his bombings hadn't hurt anyone, that had been the intention. If the people of Brookings accepted the apology he planned, he would gift the sword to the town. If they did not, he would use the sword to commit seppuku, traditional Japanese suicide by a person overcome with shame. Wow. Can you imagine? So the seppuku is this drastic, this drastic step that you take. 
he he was going to if if they would not accept and forgive what he did he was going to to do the traditional suicide because of the shame he felt for dropping the bombs on America here's a picture of him with his sword trying to make a prediction on what you think is going to happen. A large group of people awaited his arrival at the airport. To his relief, they greeted him and his family not with anger, but with warmth. Gesturing to the jetliner he'd flown in, Nabuo said in good spirit, a little larger than the plane in which I made my first trip. During the festival parade, an official introduced the Fujitas, Fujitas who bowed three times to the applauding crowd. Nabuo shook the hand of a six-year-old boy who said he wished to visit Japan. At a banquet in Nabuo's honor, Nabuo and Yoshi handed over the sword with which the library would display. I never imagined I could be back in Japan alive after my flight over America, Nabuo said softly, and I never dreamed I could visit the United States again. Later, Nabuo met one of the men who had put out his fire. You're one of the worst fire setters in the world, the man said. If you're going to set another fire, do the same good job. to make an inference there on who that man must have been. A local pilot flew Nabuo over the wilderness he had bombed and let him take the controls for a short while. Before leaving America, Nabuo said that he would like to host Brookings residence in Japan one day. That day came 23 years later. At Nabuo's expense, three Brookings High School students traveled to Japan. Accompanying them was the now grown boy from the 1962 parade. For a week, Nabuo toured his guests around his country. Their goodbyes were awash with emotion. The war is finally over for me, Nabuo said. Nabuo made three more trips back to Brookings. At a party in 1990, he was served a large submarine sandwich topped with a plane made of sliced pickles and a half olive helmet. Nabuo did not speak English, but everyone understood his reaction. In 1992, one day ahead of the 50th anniversary of his first bombing, he planted a tree seedling at the bomb site. In 1995, a pilot again flew over him flew him over the forest and gave him a brief chance to fly the plane himself. Nabuo donated thousands of dollars to the town, specifically so the library could buy children's books that celebrate other cultures. He wondered if World War II would have been different had his generation grown up reading books like those. In 1997, Brookings got word that Nabuo was not well. Urgently, a town representative flew to Tokyo to tell Nabuo in person that Brookings had made him an honorary citizen, precisely 55 years after his second bombing. The next day, at 85 and a piece, Nabuo passed away. The following year, as Nabuo had requested, Yuriko sprinkled some of his ashes over the bomb site. A flutist played a solo combining the national anthems of Japan and America. 
At the time of his death, Nabuo was the only person who had bombed the United States mainland from a plane. He spent much of his life hoping no one would ever take that title from him. And that's the end of the story. So we've read two books now that have sort of the same author's message. We read one um, yesterday that was um, called Shooting at the Stars, and it was um, also about war, and it was uh, 1914. And we had enemies that came together and also did this um, reconciliation on Christmas Day. And now we have a um, Japanese bomber that bombed a whole town. And uh, the town ended up forgiving him in 30 minutes over Oregon. So um, what we're going to do as an activity, we're going to use our digital notebook and um, I hope that you are being successful in finding those activities and uh, being able to access your digital notebook. But it's in the, the written response tab. And um, there's a prompt. And you will um, click on that, read the prompt, and then type your answer in. So like a, a paragraph, a nice paragraph. Um, the more we do this, the easier it will get. Make sure that you're going back and rereading what you're typing and making sure that you have the punctuation in there. Because in order to communicate correctly, you need to make sure that you do um, take the time to add the punctuation in there. Um, otherwise, it's difficult for the reader to understand what you're trying to say. And I definitely want to hear what you have to say because um, I know you have a wonderful voice and um, lots of great things. Fifth graders have wonderful things to say and add, and I want to hear them. And I want to know what you have to say. So I hope you enjoyed the story. I thought it was really actually pretty good. Um, so um, I will talk to you later on via Zoom. So. See you later.